I would say if the authorities didn't want us involved in the public square, they ought not to have crucified Jesus in the public square. Use humanistic principles. Well, I would say the Dan, same idea. Yeah, I would say same that. End. I would say, what's the problem with stardust bumping into stardust? In the in the cosmic picture, no, there's no problem. In the oh, cosmic right. picture, it won't matter. No, Mr. President, you are not protecting reproductive freedom. You are authorizing the destruction of freedom for one million little human beings every year. I'm sorry, my friends, but I am tired of seeing Jesus presented as a weak beggar. He is a powerful Savior, and the Gospel is not a suggestion, it is a command. Reverend Mola, don't you sympathize with that? I sympathize with every single human heart wishing to know the one true and living God, but I believe there's only one way that that can happen through Jesus Christ, and the Gospel is about repenting of sin, not celebrating it. of an amazing adventure. We will explore the spiritual abyss. You have not experienced this before. You're gonna love it. In him, we have obtained an inheritance having been, pre been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him, were sealed with a promised Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. What's up? That's beautiful. Amen. That's Ephesians chapter 1, y'all. Everybody, welcome back. This is the Gospel Heard Around the World, Apologia Radio. That's Luke the Bear. What up? I'm Jeff the Common the Ninja, and that's Zachary Conover. Yo. Direct your communications with End Abortion Now. We're so glad you joined us. Go to apologiastudios.com. That's A-P-O-L-O-G-I-A studios.com to get more. We're talking hundreds of radio shows, podcast episodes, everything from Sheologians cultish to provoke to apologia radio all there for your listening and sometimes viewing pleasure and uh, we're just grateful to god uh, for this gift to be able to be serving him in the way that we are and grateful to god for all of our all access partners and ministry with us uh, you can become all access today partner with us in this ministry get all kinds of additional content the collision episodes in full apologia academy great stuff there and great stuff coming on the book of revelation apologetics we also have the ask me anything happening once a month where it's a private stream we sit together and hang out you can ask questions and of course we have oftentimes the apologia radio after show which we're also going to do today as well for all of our all access partners in ministry thank you to all of you guys who do this ministry with us can't even calculate the the things that God has done through this ministry, and we're grateful and humbled to be a part of it. And so I uh, always want to give a shout out to our All Access Ministry partners. Uh, there's been many, many times where we've been at airports across the country or just random places, and someone comes up and says, hey, thank you for your ministry. I'm, I'm part of All Access, and, I, and, and that means so much to me because... Even the trip that we're on is some ministry trip that is probably being uh, helped by them uh, so that we can do the work that we're doing. So I'm grateful to God for all of you. Um, wanted to uh, ask everyone just quickly, we're live right now today, uh, pray. Uh, pray for Dr. James White, one of our fellow elders at Apology, uh, Apologia Church. Pray for him. He has been on an insane debate tour and teaching tour um, uh, through uh, numerous states over the last uh, month or so, month and a half. Uh, debated uh, Catholic Answers best, Trent Horn, uh, on Sola Scriptura and Purgatory. He's done a, a number of different debates over the last couple of weeks, uh, one on the Atonement. And uh, tonight he is debating in Houston uh, against Leighton Flowers, the provisionist, uh, Leighton Flowers, uh, who actually lost the last debate 
badly. And the reason why I would say it like that is because uh, I think Leighton Flower's system is uh, inconsistent. Mm-hmm. Uh, it detracts from the glory of God and the glory of God's grace. I think it, uh, it is wholly unbiblical when it comes to the nature of man. And so his, his position needs to be uh, thrown into the dustbin of Christian history. Um, and uh, so Romans chapter... Is that Romans 9? Uh, what's Romans, that? Romans 9. Romans 9. Romans 9. Yeah. Good way to yeah, put so it. Yeah, so go watch the Romans 9 debate. Uh, <laughs> and, and this is in no way an attempt to be arrogant. It's We care about what the scriptures say. Love Leighton as a brother. I think that his system is doing damage to the gospel of grace in terms of how gracious is God's grace. Um, And so I think his system needs to be uh, exposed for the unbiblical uh, thing that it is. And so Romans chapter 9, his system I think was shown to be inconsistent, not exegetically based, and um, uh, very much man-centered. And so Romans 9, I think there's no question uh, Leighton Flowers lost that debate badly, and he needed to lose it badly because we care about what the scriptures say. And tonight they're talking about John 6.44. And I think the question is, uh, John 6.44, does it teach unconditional election? I think I have that right. Oh, man. Um, I'll double check that. <laughs> yeah, just... I think that's the, the title. So anyway, um, uh, let's see here. So what what is it? He, uh, James sent the link to us for tonight. So we can announce to everybody where to go on YouTube to yep. go watch it. It's uh, What's the name of the church? I'm thinking again. It's, it's, uh, is it something Lutheran. Lutheran? Is it First church. Lutheran? Yeah, you're right. The title's... What, uh, does, John six forty four teach unconditional election. Yeah, it's um, some first Lutheran Houston. Okay, so if you go to YouTube after this and that's look, the channel too. Yeah, look up the channel first Lutheran Houston. You'll see they have the they have the stream up and ready to go, so you can you know go on there, click on it, ring the bell or whatever. So when it goes live, I think it's going live in a couple hours, two it's hours, six p.m. our time, so f- almost four. Almost four hours. Four hours from now. Okay, so it's just be there, check that out. I think it's an important debate, and it really is. The reason I mention it is because it really has a lot to do with what we're talking about today. We've been doing a Sorry, series. Three hours. Three hours. Uh, we've been doing a series uh, defending Calvinism uh, over the course of a couple of months. We, it's been it's been you know sporadic uh, just because of you know things that come up. We need to talk about those instead. And so defending Calvinism today, we're actually on the last uh, part of this discussion uh, where we fill out the details of uh, what is Calvinism, what are the doctrines of grace, are they biblical? And so if you're just getting into this discussion, I just want to encourage you to go back and listen at the start of this series, this radio discussion series. Of course, we have sermons on this, and uh, there's tons and tons of great works uh, over the centuries defending this from a biblical perspective. Uh, but today we are, are, are moving our way through that acrostic, uh, TULIP, Total Depravity, Unconditional Election, Limited Atonement, Irresistible Grace, and Perseverance of the Saints. Uh, we started the discussion with the sovereignty of God, because re- in reality, that's where you really yep. need to start. That's, that, that was already assumed in the background of all of that discussion. Uh, but if you're just getting into this discussion, we want you to understand uh, that the purpose of this discussion, why even have it, is not to bring... Di- unnecessary division within the body of Christ. It's not to just simply uh, firm up your commitments to your clique or your crew or your team or your group. It's not even to get you to join our club sort of a thing. It really is, from our perspective, um, an attempt to defend the glory of God's grace and the true graciousness of grace. How gracious is God's grace. That's the key issue. And so for us, the the meaningfulness of this discussion is centered right around that it makes so much of God and Christ, and of course the work of the Holy Spirit, the triune God of Scripture. It makes so much of God and His work in salvation and so much less of man. And of course we believe that it's because it comes just right out of the scriptures, and and that's why we're doing this. Uh, I I have so many men and women that I respect who are not reformed completely in their thinking, they're not Calvinistic, uh, that I love and I cherish, and I know they're brothers and sisters, and we're grateful for them. Um, and uh, we know that this is technically an in-house debate to some degree, uh, and I would say to some degree, because there's some people who are, you know, full-blown Arminian that go the other direction, mm-hmm. that I would say, well, you've now abandoned the faith right. in terms of how you're trying to attain salvation. But generally speaking, this is this is an in-house debate, and um, that means that we're all brothers and sisters, but it's an in-house debate that has such dramatic consequences on our understanding of the gospel, and then from that point, how do you preach the gospel? And, and this would be a good point— um, just to bring up in terms of um, consequences, mm-hmm. uh, 
the consequences. So I've seen a lot of discussions lately, and we've dealt with this before, talking about, uh, well, Calvinists can't preach the gospel. And I'm like, what do you mean, can't preach the gospel? Like, we believe God uses his church and the mm-hmm. means of the gospel to bring his elect to himself. But they <clears> don't, I'm a Calvinist, but and they, I also preach the gospel. Yeah, but they don't mean that. What they're saying is that the, they can't preach the gospel like us. And mm-hmm. what they mean by that is these Calvinists can't go out into the world and say, hey, Jesus loves you. Jesus died for you. And so they don't even preach the gospel like us. And I'm thinking to myself, that's an important discussion to have. Yeah. Because I don't see any of the apostles preaching the gospel like that in the holy scriptures and so or I think, even jesus yeah it's <laughs> interesting isn't it and it's, a, it's it's the challenge it's like you know calvinists can't preach the gospel and walk up to somebody and say hey jesus loves you and he died for you and i want to say wait a second i think it's in reverse you have a proclamation of the gospel and a means of getting it out there that doesn't sound anything like Jesus or the apostles because you show me in the New yeah. Testament where the apostles went into the world preaching the gospel like that. They didn't walk up to random uh, bystanders and say, hey, Jesus loves you, man. God loves you, bro. Jesus died for you. And you know, won't you let him into your heart? Won't you give him a chance? Listen, that, that it shows how much tradition has overwhelmed yeah. the evangelical church church in the West, because we think, not because the Bible, but we think because of our tradition and our systems of of evangelism, that that's how you preach the gospel. And these Calvinists over here can't preach it like us. It's like, no, the Calvinists basically want to follow the scriptures on how we preach the gospel, like the apostles, by proclaiming what Christ did and who he was, and then commanding men everywhere to repent and to believe the gospel. It's this general call of repentance and faith in Jesus. Here's who Jesus is. This is what Jesus did. He lived, he died, he rose again from the dead. He's ascended, he's seated, and, and the call was repent. God's going to come back and judge. Repent and believe the gospel. It was never this, hey man, God loves you, bro. He loves you so much. Jesus died for you, man. It's like, well, you know, that gets to the heart of the matter here, which surrounds the whole issue of the issue of tulip it's these are all de- biblically definitional things in terms of god's grace man's nature what the atonement accomplishes who it was for and how god brings about this salvation so that's what we're doing today that's a huge lead in but i'll be honest perseverance of the saints i think it's one of the most overwhelming ones it's like you almost don't even need to like really do a lot of preparation for this because it's like well let's just get the list of scriptures out and let's just <coughs> plod through them yeah uh but before we get into that. Um, I, we have a couple things we want to share with you guys. I got mine on today. Do you? You got your eye on layer patch? You're still waiting nope. for your box, aren't you? Nope. Yeah. Yeah, you're waiting for yours. We got to call him up and say, get Zach his box. Get, give it a, give get him a call. Zach give his box. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> ionlayer.com, get we, we've been telling it. you a lot about, about get, get eye on it. Get right eye uh, on uh, it. Uh, we've been telling you a lot about these guys. Uh, grateful for what they uh, they have done. They've, they've created a a product for physical wellness uh, that uh, I'm just, I'm a huge, huge supporter of. uh, And it has to do with NAD. Go and research the benefits of NAD. And you'll see why for years I've been, you know, looking into this and wanting to do it. Uh, You've heard me mention that um, people have been doing it for years through IV treatment, but it is extremely painful to do that. Uh, Of course, not just the needle, but the NAD treatment getting Mm -hmm. into your system. It's, it takes a lot of focus. It's just very difficult, but the benefits for your system are just incredible. Go research it for yourself. They found a way to do it through a medical patch uh, that gets into your system over through over like 10 to 14 hours. You get um, really high quality NAD. You get a lot of it at just a, f- a quarter of the price. I think it was so much less than what is normally paid for an NAD treatment. Uh, it's blessed my life. It's blessed my wife's life. Um, and uh, if you want to invest in that, in your health and well-being in the future, uh, go to ionlayer.com, type in APOLOGIA in all caps in the coupon code. You'll get a big discount. And all your support for that goes also to APOLOGIA Radio for all the ministries that we do. And so I just wanted to point you guys to that. And Luke, I'll let you go. Yeah, well, uh, <clears throat> today I wanted to just mention some of our tracks that we got here, these little pretty tracks we got that are super awesome and They're also attractive. have... They- <laughs> 
very nice looking. That's good. They're beautiful. I appreciate that. They are attractive. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we've been selling a bunch of these and they're super great and awesome. And they the also Mormon have the one? gospel. That is the Mormon. There you go. So this one right here, just a, this is a track for Mormons. Great thing to have on hand when you, when you see Mormon missionaries going through your neighborhood or coming to your door. The Gospel for Mormons track uh, tract has has brought a lot of Latter Day Saints out of Mormons to true saving faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, this tract is is has been a blessing to to have on hand. Uh, explains the the differences between the Mormon Gospel and the Mormon God, and uh, gets into how a person can have peace with God. It is uh, a fantastic tract to give out to the Mormon missionary at your door or to your Mormon friends. And Which family. we're getting ready for Easter pageant. That's here right. Very quickly, we so, hand yeah. out thousands of these. So this one here hope for tomorrow that's uh for suicide if you need anybody that's struggling with suicide it's a really good track um this is uh zach zachary wrote this one mm-hmm. um don't murder your baby and uh we give that out at the mill um you also wrote that one too mm-hmm. right that's just a general good news track what is the good news of god and then sex conscience in the gospel we hand out at the strip clubs so it's a good Good track calling All people to repentance. All available at Apologia yep. Studios Shop store. Shop.apologiastudios.com. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's, a, it's a store at ApologiaStudios.com. Yep. All right, so everybody, we are going to get into the discussion today, Perseverance of the Saints. So uh, we started the discussion, of course, with the sovereignty of God, because that is really where you, you need to. That's where, that's where Paul puts this discussion, okay? Mm-hmm. And so uh, you, you remember at the beginning of the episode today that I read to you from Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians is just filled with so much testimony to the grace of God in salvation and the power of God's grace, the plan of God in salvation. Um, but in Ephesians chapter 1, there, in starting in verse 11, you have that we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. He works all things Mm -hmm. according to the counsel of his will. It's a very different view of God than is popular today in particular systems of... um, you open theism for sure um um, even in systems like molinism uh this is a perspective of god that paul clearly has has the the prophets and apostles all have about god's total sovereignty over all things and it's interesting when he refers to the inheritance that we have and the and the the being predestined it's because of the one who works all things after the counsel of his will. Right. And then it gets to this really incredible promise yeah. that I confess I have to regularly wrangle my heart to get back to. And that is that the promise is you are sealed with the promised Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of of his glory. There's the purpose of it, to the praise of his glory. So sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, it's a guarantee. Yeah. It's a guarantee. And when I mention like, you know, wrangle my own heart back to it, you know, we're creatures. We're creatures. We have, you know, small brains and and uh, not a lot of strength some days. And if you're like me and you are uh, very aware of your past sins and what God has delivered you from, mm-hmm. You've probably had, even as a firm believer and a joyful believer, moments where you remember and you reflect on just how much God has saved you from and how awful you've been. Um, and you look at a promise like this, and that's whew, that's like you know, it's water for your soul. It just it brings you back to life again because in the end, it 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 reminds us as God's people that this is God's plan of salvation. Mm-hmm. It's nothing that I did. Right. I didn't acquire this. It wasn't me. <clears throat> clamoring for God and trying to pull on, you know, and pull away up to, to God uh, in a ladder to God. This is something God did. It was according to his will. He does according to his will in the heavens above and in the earth below. And here you have, he works all things according to the counsel of his will. This is his plan. He predestined. He gives the inheritance. He gives the Holy Spirit. Here, here's where this guarantee is from. You have this inheritance, this possession. You are going to acquire it. And why is that? Because you're going to continue to be faithful, because you're going to just get, you're going to give it all you've got. You're going to be the one that has the strength and the spiritual understanding. You're going to have all the investment you need. No, the answer is this: God, He did this. 
He predestined to you to adoption as sons. He's the one that's done this. It's according to the counsel of his will. He's the one accomplishing it. It's the Holy Spirit within you, guarantee of this, this future inheritance and possession of it. And so when you talk about perseverance of the saints, what's amazing, and then I'll, I'll kick it to you guys here, is that generally speaking, the evangelical West has been so influenced by the Reformation in terms of even just like a, a smattering of sola scriptura, even if it's not a really uh, very rigorous understanding of it, like that's God's word, we need to believe that book, those are his words, everything's going to come from that book. Well, you can thank a Calvinist for that and the, the spirit of the Reformation that gave us that, so praise the Lord for that. But the general uh, consensus, I think, that you would get out of the, you know, at least at least strong evangelical today is that no i cannot lose my salvation right. god has saved me jesus died for me and uh he's going to keep me to the end it and just so might be called eternal security eternal security so people will say that they'll say i believe in eternal security that once saved always saved and we would say to that yeah we believe that once you're saved you're always saved we would definitely challenge some of the understanding that people have today about once saved, always saved. Like a lot of IFB people, independent fundamentalist, separated Baptists, will say like once saved, always saved, meaning I can go door knocking and uh, after 30 seconds of talking to a guy scaring uh, the hell out of him, literally, uh, he prayed a prayer with me, and as long as he, he prayed that prayer, mm. and uh, it doesn't matter what happens to him after that, like if he never <clears throat> never desires worship, never desires to read the Word, never pursues holiness, doesn't matter, he prayed that prayer, like he's saved, once saved, always saved. We'd say, well, that's not exactly yeah. how this and works. And they'll count that as winning souls. Winning souls. And right. so what we would say is, yeah, we believe in eternal security. We believe that once you're saved, you're always saved because we believe in the perseverance of the saints. And that is to say that if God has saved somebody, if he's chosen to save them, Christ has died for their sins and atoned for their sins, and the Holy Spirit has regenerated them and brought them to life and he indwells them, you will persevere until the end because it is God who is working in you. It is God's work from the beginning it's his work throughout it it's his work yeah. to the end mm -hmm. it's all to the praise of his glorious grace this is god's work so will you be saved forever if you have true saving faith in jesus no question because it is jesus who says that he gives his sheep eternal life and nothing can snatch them out of his hand and so that's perseverance of the saints is that god is going to cause you to persevere you will pursue god you will pursue holiness you will be sanctified because you are a new creature you are mm -hmm. a new creation in jesus you have been bought with a price you belong to god you're indwelled by the holy spirit of god so salvation is not merely like sort of a, a god comes and punches a ticket or God uh, and you sort of high five one time on earth here and be like, I'll catch you later. Uh, it's, it's a much bigger, more beautiful thing than that. Uh, salvation is real salvation. He really saves his elect. And so perseverance of the saints, God will keep those he saves. Go ahead. I'd love how you connected uh, regeneration to that with the verse from Ephesians too, because this is, we talked last week about irresistible grace, the effectual calling based on the spirit. If there's one thing that's unfortunate about the letter in the acrostic perseverance, I think we would more uh, desire to call it preservation of the saints. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, perseverance, like you said, implies that God began this and now it's up to you. Whereas we would right, say, exactly. whereas yeah. we would say, That's a good point. no, uh, what we're emphasizing here when we talk about preservation of the saints is God's power, his grace to finish the work that he started in us. So that doesn't mean that, you know, I, even after the spirit has regenerated someone that they won't fall into sin, like mm -hmm. even serious sin in some cases, but it does mean that no true believer can have a final or a total fall from grace. Right. Like the apostle Peter is a great example of that. Mm -hmm. Like he messes up in a glorious way, abandoning mm -hmm. even his Lord. And then he's the one that is uh, restored, strengthened, confirmed, and established once again mm -hmm. uh, to minister to the church of Jesus Christ in a right. dramatic uh, fashion. So the core question at the bottom of this, bring it down to a, I mean, bring it right in your kitchen, really. How do I know that I will remain a Christian until the end? That's really the question that we're answering with this. How do I know that God's unfailing love for me 
will never change and that I'm forever secure in his grasp. That's really what we're talking about when it comes to preservation of the, of the saints is God's power to save us, God's power to finish what he started in us, and that effectual power that the Spirit has now worked in uh, the hearts of God's people, um, that will overcome the power of sin and death. Sin and death won't have mm-hmm. the final say, right? The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness will not overcome it. So the one who started a good work will finish it, and he will keep us to the end. Yeah, that's great. I'm glad you brought up that point. I think, and that goes back to, again to just starting with the S, right? God's sovereignty, sovereignty. That you know, and so that's an excellent, excellent point. The way you worded that, I like to use uh, definite redemption sometimes too, like as another way to word that. But um, like, like you were saying, Jeff, like the majority of the church affirms this point. Like they'll they'll reject the other. <laughs> The right. other four. Okay. I'm a one point. I, I yeah. accept that. I accept the, perseverance yeah. in the saints. Yeah. And I think this is like the one point where, you, like, if someone truly holds to like the, the ability to lose your salvation, like, then you start going, mm, we have, we might, Houston, we have a problem. Right. <laughs> right. Like, like you have to, like, those are the people that that start to really veer away from orthodoxy at that point. Like, you you could almost get the other ones be wrong, yeah. and the other ones, but you really get this one wrong. Like, we there's you're probably often some other cult at that point almost. Um, and there are, there are people that, you know, maybe grew up thinking you could lose your salvation. They really don't understand it. And they're just regurgitating what they thought. But people, I think that really truly hold to that and argue for that position. Like you're treading, yeah. you're dancing on the line of orthodoxy at that point. So yeah, biblical orthodoxy. Yeah. And, and it, here's the thing. When you talk about <clears throat> Tulip, we're, we're, we have tried to make the argument that it's a, it's a, biblical line of thought that all of these biblical categories are connected if you disconnect these points that relate to the atonement the nature of man uh, the grace of god and salvation if you disconnect the points um your system doesn't make any sense because they are all they all sort of hang together because they're all part of the biblical flow of thought in soteriology Soteriology is the doctrine of salvation, soteriology having to do with salvation. And so the argument is being made that, that the reason this, this has been such a blessing to the church is because when, during the time of the Reformation, the issue of the graciousness of God's grace is front and center, and it's, 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 it, was, it was that way with Rome and where Rome, Rome fell into apostasy, I, I agree with Sproul when he talked about Rome as a Christian communion. Uh, when they declared war on or rejected the doctrine of justification by faith, they ceased being a legitimate Christian church, no matter how orthodox they are everywhere else. And so, of course, during the Reformation, this topic was the hot topic. How is a person reconciled to God? How does a person have peace with God? What is the true nature of man before he's saved? And then, of course, you get into the controversy with uh, the followers of Jacob Arminius, and there was a lot of time and study and, and work thrown into uh, what happened in the remonstrance, the protest, mm-hmm. uh, the, that general protest. And so if you don't know the history, if I'm talking over right now because you're like, I don't even understand any of this stuff, just know that this discussion of the grace of God and salvation is an important one. And I believe what had took place during the time of the Reformation was a blessing to the church because it brought so much light out of the scriptures into all of these other areas where we diminish the glory of God and salvation. We make much of man, we make less of God, and that is uh, not only unbiblical and wrong to do in terms of the glory of God and what's at stake, but it's also, practically speaking, and in our circumstances, so destructive. Because I'm, I'm speaking from a pastoral perspective here, not just my own personal perspective of wrestling with my own sin, wrestling with my own deficiencies and my own weaknesses over the many years of being a Christian. But pastorally speaking, if you take this whole um, uh, story of redemption and salvation and you, you put it into the hands of the sinner and say, well, really, in essence, this is kind of also you— it's about your uh, own cooperation. It's about what you've done, mm-hmm. and it's about you participating in it. In it, yeah, Jesus did all these things, but in the end, like it's it's really the ball's in your court, my friend. And so, if you do that, I can just tell you as pastorally, that doesn't heal people. It doesn't bring a person out of a pit. 
Uh, and I'm not saying you, 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 you share these truths because I really want to pull a person out of a pit. I'm saying, practically speaking, I've seen the Word of God in its, in its clarity, sufficiency, and simplicity heal people from depression and misery and fear over the future and anxiety and, and, and bless people with the joy of God's salvation. And I think man-centered systems, practically speaking, destroy all that. So I'm saying this has theological implications, and it has practical implications for your life here and for the life of the church. Mm. And so um, don't rob God of his glory. Assurance in particular. That's what I mean. Yeah. I was going to say Rome's such a great example, too, because obviously in Roman Catholicism, you earn your way. Right, so you, that's your role in salvation is you got to earn that, but you also got mortal sins, and you, you know, you can just as easily not earn your way to to salvation and uh, be damned forever yeah, because well, of those have, sins. So yeah, sacramental yeah. system that you're constantly in this hamster wheel of the sacramental yeah. system. You you don't know that you have peace with God. I mean, you can go from peace to, with God to rebellion and war with God on uh, between ten and ten thirty a.m. Um, you don't know that you have peace with him. You've got, of course, the, added into there the doctrine of purgatory, uh, which apparently modern-day Roman Catholics don't aren't really exactly sure about how that works. Uh, listen to the Trent Horn debate with James White. It's 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 a stunning a stunning difference between old school Catholics and the new modern Roman Catholic apologists in terms of purgatory and things like that. But in the end, yeah, it's a, it's a system that's just this constant rotation of peace with God, no peace with God. He loves me, he loves me not. He loves me, he loves me not. And, and so much of that, they'll acknowledge that God has grace, Jesus died for sinners, but the, the ball is in your court. I mean, it really has to do with your cooperation, your obedience, not the work of God in right. salvation, in saving his elect. And so this has so many implications, but let's get to, um, let's just, I mean, I think, with, with, unless you wanted to but say it, something. Would I be able, I, I'd like to set up a little question. I don't want to get too far in the weeds with it yeah. before we jump to the verses, but I want to set this up by saying there are true believers. There are those who are regenerate. And then there, the Bible speaks of false professors. So sure. these are people that have the outward appearance of godliness and religion, but inwardly their hearts are far from God. Um, you know, they went out from us because they were not actually exactly. of us, right? They weren't true believers. They weren't regenerate, blood-bought uh, believers, and that was evidenced uh, in the end by their works, right, by their life. So th- I think the question I have here is, and hopefully this will help people that are thinking through this, when we talk about perseverance of the saints, you're talking about people never being lost, right? like God always holding on to them. So what do we do with that in light of the conditional statements that we see in Scripture about if ye obey, or if you obey my commandments, then you're my disciples, or the warning passages, for example, in Hebrews 6 that talk about, you know, people seemingly, oh, when I read that, seems like people fall away. I know there's a way to understand that passage, um, but I'm just curious, how do we help people think through, how do you understand, well, are you saying then that this warning, it's no big deal for me as a believer, I shouldn't take it seriously because God knows I'll never be lost? Yeah. So there are definitely warning passages, really, all throughout. And, you know, you can look at warning passages from Hebrews. You can look at warning passages or passages that, that really illustrate uh, that there is such a thing as a false profession of faith. There is a living faith. There is a dead faith, like in James chapter 2. There's warnings against those things. There's warnings against people who would profess to believe but then have no works. Like, they're, that's legitimate. Like, we're not saying, like, oh, you just say you believe, you're, fine, you're, you're good. No, it's true saving faith that saves. And so there are, there are clear warning passages that are given generally out in different contexts. So like the book of Hebrews, you've got warning passages coming that are coming in a specific context of people who have the temptation to go back to temple, back to sacrifices, back to that old priesthood, all that stuff. There's warnings there. Like, you do that, you're trampling Christ underfoot, all that stuff. There's specific warnings there. And like I said, let's just take those two examples. James 2, you have pretty much a, a, a very serious warning there against people who have a said faith, a profession of faith, but they don't have a living faith, and they think that that profession of faith is going to save them. Uh, and No, and James is like, no, living faith is a real faith that produces works. And here's my examples. Father Abraham demonstrates this this way. And so what we would say is that when it comes to this issue, we take the warning passages seriously, but the warning passages always have a context 
to them, mm -hmm. like in the context of Hebrews, but there's always this assumption clearly throughout Scripture and even within the, contained within the warning passages that you're talking about people who truly don't believe. They have a said faith, a fake faith, and the warning is there. You go back. You abandon Christ. Here are the consequences. And like Zach brings up, it's one of the best examples you could possibly give because it is so clear and sharp. They went out from us mm -hmm. in order to show they were never really of us. Now, you can't get around that, right? That's not, that's not saying, that's not an affirmation. Ah, oh, this person was really saved. They really know God. They, they were indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God and they got lost. They, didn't, they couldn't hack it. They weren't obedient enough. Like what they fell, whatever the case may be, is they went out to show it. They were never really of us. Or when Jesus says, many people will come to me on the day and say, Lord, Lord, didn't we cast out demons in your name? Didn't we do this in your name? And, and people have tried to use that passage to say like, oh, see, they lost their salvation. It literally says, depart <laughs> from <laughs> me. I never, yeah. never knew you. Never. There was never a relationship between Jesus and these people that he says, depart. There's no relationship. He's not lying to them. He's not faking, saying, oh, we really were, but I didn't know you. No, he says, depart from me. I never knew you. Never. There's never a relationship there. He's not saying depart from me to people who he actually knew because the people that he knows are the people that he foreknows. He chooses to enter into intimate relationship with John, uh, Romans chapter 8. Those whom he foreknew, he predestined. And so uh, this, whole, this whole discussion, again, rests every time firmly on God himself and his sovereignty and his course, his providence and history to save his elect. And we take the warning passages seriously in scripture. And I have to, I have to just say this bluntly. I give warning passages as, as often as I, I give warning. <laughs> yeah. I give warnings as a pastor, as often as I can from the pulpit at Apologia Church, I warn people, I think, what I fairly yeah. regularly, yeah. Agreed. that, you know, that there's people in this room mm -hmm. that think that they're Christians yeah. and you don't truly believe in Christ. You, you're, you love the Christian context. You love the Christian culture. You feel safe here. You love this. I mean, seriously, being a part of a body of Christ, a, a faithful body of Christ is awesome. You have people that love you, will serve you, will they'll, they'll like jump when you have pain or you need something, people have like, we have like meal trains happening 24 hours a day at Apology at Church. Like someone's hurting. Just from the babies. You got five, you got five weeks of meals. You're going to have families delivering your meals for five weeks. Someone's uh, car's broken down. Who can fix cars in our church? Let's get them on that. How can we get your car to pay for your rent? It's nice to be in a Christian community. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. wonderful. But sometimes, maybe people like the Christian community, not because they really believe in Jesus, but because they love this loving place. And I've seen it. I have seen apostasy. Pastor Luke and I have been pastoring Apologia Church since the very beginning. Yes. I planted the church. I ordained Pastor Luke as 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 the next feller uh, feller elder. Feller, feller elder. elder. <laughs> and he's been there since he's been there since day one. We've been doing this from the very very start. And I we can tell you stories, horrible stories that break my heart and yeah. break our hearts mm -hmm. of people who were with us, and then they finally after a while you can't be a part of a of a body of Christ that is consistently preaching God's word, mm -hmm. just testifying to God's holiness testifying to the authority of God, calling people to repentance, calling people to holiness. You can't fake it in a church like that long, for very long. So we usually see, we've seen, this is just sort of, this is, that, well, I'm not saying this is, this is how long it takes. I'm saying that in my experience generally at a faithful church, someone may love the community, profess the faith, look outwardly, outwardly like a believer for, I'd say about two to three years. Is, is what I've seen. About two to three years is about how long it takes. So I can think of, of people, like, for example, a guy that was with us from the very beginning. It took about two to three years. Uh, he came out of a homosexual lifestyle. He actually had HIV as a result of it. Um, he looked on all on the outside like he was a believer. And after about two or three years, he started to not come to church, started to disappear. Then he came to us one day saying I needed to talk, and he looked like his soul was gone. Mm -hmm. uh, he looked like he was literally the walking dead. And he told us that he loved his sin with other men more than he loved Jesus, and he never really trusted in Jesus, never really uh, did believe in Jesus, and he wanted to go back to his homosexual lifestyle. 
and uh, it just took a little while. And we had other people. I could think of uh, of a female that was with us for for two or three years. Looked very much like a believer on the outside, and then she's abandoned Christ, and today she lives as a man. Um, and uh, yeah, that's the truth. Um, I can think of that. St- I can repeat that story where people have been among us, profess the faith, and eventually you go, "Oh, you were never really of us," and it was obvious. And most of the time, I can tell you when I've had conversations with these people, they've said as much. I never really believed this. Mm-hmm. Like I never, I, I never really believed in Christ. Um, I got a guy tell me once he was he was uh, caught for some uh, uh, sexual sin, and uh, just practicing sexual sin and so we brought him together to talk to him call him to repentance and hopefully help him and he just told us bluntly he said that he loved having sex with girls more than he loved jesus and he loved uh, pornography more than he loved jesus yeah. he just said it bluntly which i appreciated the honesty yeah was, i mean that's yeah. helpful mm. to hear that instead of the fake you know oh no, i'm struggling with my faith you know when you're really not you just you really want to leave uh so you would say that warning people warning in particular the people the gathered assembly is twofold in its effect it for the believers it's the means that god uses to help them persevere because the true believers will yeah but for those that don't know christ that aren't regenerate it acts as judgment yeah and condemnation upon them ultimately yeah, yeah. and it, the, the regular call to follow paul's lead examine yeah. yourselves to see whether you are in the faith yeah. that needs to come mm-hmm. out that what's well, a warning mm-hmm. right that's a warning to people to say hey look don't don't just recognize this fallen world you might like these stories. You might like the idea of a savior, but uh, has have you repented and turned to him as your mm-hmm. savior and Lord? Um, or are you just in love with the Christian context, the Christian culture, the Christian community? You just love this stuff because it's nice. Um, there's some dark places in this world and there's some rough people. And so when, when you go from like the rough people, the dark place to like this, you know, Christian community where there's love and there's sacrifice and there's service and there's uh, hospitality and there's giving and graciousness, you go, I like this better than I like the rough area. <laughs> Things that aren't common in right. clown world. But it doesn't mean that you believe in Jesus. You yeah. just love, you just like his people. They're nice. Yeah. They're great. Uh, Christians aren't perfect people, but Christians are the best people in the world. Um, and, uh, it was, I didn't make that up. Uh, that was Tozer that said that. Mm. And, um, I, I've, I remember that from the first time I heard it, uh, cause this really helped me too, to remember, uh, those two important things, the best people, not perfect <clears throat> people. Um, so anyway, I, I figured what we do for the last part here is as we've explained some of these things, let's just start plotting through a bunch of texts. Yeah, for sure. Let's just plot. Let's through do texts. it. Yeah. I was just gonna say before I lose this thought was just. That's why Jesus gave the parable of the soils in Matthew 13. Like, yeah, it there's different levels of growth, yeah. and um, you know, because people that want to deny perseverance of those things are like, well, look, these people, you know, lost their soil. And you're like, no, no. Read, read it again. No, mm-hmm. <laughs> wasn't know? good soil. Yeah, so that's that's a perfect. I, then I'm I'm thankful to Jesus for giving that parable. Thank you for those parables, Jesus. Yeah, They're because, really helpful here because then it explains the the yeah. um you know the complaints against this position. So. Right, and and it's, it's exactly. The, and, and I went through the parables uh, myself in one of our sermon uh, series. I think it was, it was yeah Matthew. Um, there's good soil, and to, in order to to get good soil, uh, it takes some preparation ahead of time. Um, you gotta you gotta work that ground, and so that's something that God does, and that seed gets in mm-hmm. there. And then it gets in, bears fruit, some 30, 60, 100 fold. Um, and then sometimes it looks like it is real, and then it gets scorched, and sometimes it gets snatched away. Uh, but Choked only out by the cares o- of the world. Only one of them actually gets into good soil and bears fruit. Yeah. But also, let's just notice, I think it's important, uh, that the one that gets in good soil grows up and bears fruit. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's the expectation of real salvation and good soil, is that it actually grows up, and it actually bears fruit. And that is the, the description of the person who's truly in Christ, the person who's truly saved. Uh, so, you know, honestly, this one could go for days. Yeah, there's a lot. Here. There's so many, but I we wanted to at least give you like some, some big chunks and anchors to set in. And of course, we couldn't help but start with uh, where are the debate's going to be landing tonight between uh, Dr. White and Professor Flowers. And that's John chapter 6. We've already done it a bunch in this series because it's the words of the Lord Jesus. I think we all need to listen to. Here's what Jesus says in John um, 6.35. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Okay, stop. Is that true? 
That's what I want to ask myself when I read something like that. Do I believe what Jesus said there? Jesus says, the person who comes to him will not hunger, and whoever believes in him will never thirst. All right, so let's say somebody comes to Jesus, they believe in Jesus, they really do, and then they end up being hungry and thirsty. Is Jesus a liar? Yeah, he'd be a liar, because the promise there is that they will not hunger, will never thirst, for those who truly believe, for those who believe in him. Okay, so that's where the anchor is. Perseverance of the saints is right there. I'm never going to hunger. I'm never going to thirst because Jesus says, if I come to him, if I believe in him, I never will. And God cannot lie. So I'm saying that like, when you deny perseverance of the saints, when you deny that God keeps those whom he saves, you are in some sense starting to strike away and chip away at the incarnation itself because you're saying... No, they can be hungry and they can thirst. And I'm saying, no, God cannot lie. This is a promise. This is a promise from God himself. He says this, but I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. He's talking to people who've seen him. They look like believers. They don't believe. And he answers their unbelief. He says, all that the father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never, I will never I will never cast out. Okay? Never hunger, never thirst, cast it out. Where where do we get the idea that though we can truly come to Jesus, believe in him, and that we'll actually be cast out hungry and thirsty? Where do we get that idea? It's not from the words of Jesus. Because right. if I, I'm going to say, I want to believe what he says. I want to I want to take it seriously. I don't want to deny his word. I don't want to detract from it. And so when Jesus says, come to me, never hungry, never thirsty, I'll never cast you out. I want to believe that. And, and when, you, when you go, well, I affirm that, but that but is a very big but, right? It is because it is destructive to everything Jesus says here. I didn't mean for that to come out like that. No, I got a song in my head. I didn't, I didn't mean for that to come out like that, but it did. Um, so here we go. He then says, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out, for I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me, and this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, there, and, but raise it up on the last day. There are a people given to Jesus by the Father that he says he will lose none of them, he will raise them up. And this is what's important here. I said, we already said this a bunch of times. From the very beginning, we started this series talking about the sovereign, all that he pleases. Well, look, here's what he says. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have mm -hmm. eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Eternal life. Is eternal life yours to lose? I guess that would be the question. It's a forever life, right? Forever life. It is uh, the Father's will. He loses none. It's eternal life. I will raise you up. There's just, I, look, there's no way out of that. And that's, you know, why are you a Calvinist, Pastor Jeff? Well, for a number of reasons, but I really want to believe John 6. That's, that's it. I mean, my first, I, you guys have heard me say a bunch of times, my first Bible reading was in the Gospel of John over and over and over and mm. over and over. And I think that was a real blessing uh, in my experience because I already believed all this stuff before I even knew about what Calvinism or Arminianism or Provisionism or whatever is. And I just said, that's my Savior. And he says that's what he's going to do. I'm, I believe that. And I've always had that anchor since the beginning of my faith in Jesus is that this is what God is going to do for me. Um, so, in John, that's John 6. Did you want to... I was just going to say, there's there's no way out of that chapter it's without, pretty airtight. without dancing a theological jig. Mm -hmm. You know, and tonight in the debate, there's going to be a lot of ballroom dancing going on. I'll say that. Ballroom dancing. <laughs> there's going to be a lot of dancing. <laughs> um, now, you... Uh, I mean, going to the Old Testament here, speaking of the New Covenant, um, Jeremiah 32... Verse 40, I will make with them an everlasting covenant that I will not turn away from doing good to them. And I will put the fear of me in their hearts that they may not turn from me. So the power of the new covenant is such that God's spirit is going to take up residence within the hearts of his people. To what end? Well, the fear of him is going to be put in their hearts, true believers, that they may not turn away. 
So God's going to ensure that that's going to happen. Promise of the new covenant. I also like the one you brought up in Ephesians. That's a great one. Being sealed by the Holy Spirit. Yeah. For what? For the inheritance that we have, which Peter also tells us in 1 Peter chapter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, mercy he mm-hmm. has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So this is the resurrection power of the Spirit that's alive in every believer. To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading kept in heaven for you who by God's power, whose power? God's power. Are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. I like how some English translations translate that appropriately as reserved in heaven for you. Yeah. I like, I like, we like those reservations. I got a reservation. Yeah. Mm. I'm supposed to be here. I got a reservation. You got my name down. (laughs) Yeah. 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 You got a reservation. In the Lamb's Book of Life. That's right. No less. Hey, I'm here for my reservation. Oh yeah. Your name's down here. We got your reservation. Come on in. Right. Uh, Yeah. Kept in heaven for you, reserved Mm. in heaven for you. Yeah. It's powerful. And John chapter 10, uh, we've already done some of John 10 in the course of this discussion in this series talking about the atonement itself, Christ laying his life down for his sheep. But just notice notice some of the things that Jesus says here about his sheep. He talks about him being the good shepherd, and he says this in John 10, 14. He says, I'm the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. All right, so that's specificity. That's not some general idea, some nebulous you know, group of people. That's a, that's a very specific. I know who are mine, and they know me. By the way, this is John 10. That is right after John 6, mm-hmm. right? It's behind it. And uh, in John 6, Jesus says, the Father has given me a people. So now he says here, I know who my sheep are, and they know who I am. And then he says this, he says, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Mm. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. Not, I hope they will, maybe they will. They will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down. I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. And of course, it goes down into John chapter 10, 22. And this is where it gets beautiful, I think, is when Jesus um, is then confronting their un- their their unbelief in verse 24, the Jews gathered around him and said to him, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. I love this answer. Jesus answered them, I told you, <laughs> right? They're, tell us if you're the Messiah. I did. And he says, and you do not believe. Father's name bear witness about me, but you, this is powerful, do not believe because you are not mm. among my sheep. Because he already said, I know who my mm. sheep are, and they know me. I will bring them. And then here he says, you don't believe because you're not. Mm. You're not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. I believe that. I believe that. Mm-hmm. So, so where, where does the Bible teach perseverance of the saints? Well, right there. There's two places that are very powerful places, and I think um, places that uh, make this relationship with Jesus so unbelievably beautiful yeah. and powerful. And uh, I'll just <clears throat> confess, that's the anchor of my life and my soul right there. Life is hard. Life is horrible. This world is sinful and rotten at times. And there's my anchors. I hang there a lot. Mm. That's where God has, has, has brought me to a great place of peace and joy in my life is I know that this is his work. It's his doing. It's because of his love. It's because of his grace. It's because of his mercy. And I'm only going to hang in there to the end because he's done this. Mm. And he promises He's going to complete it. I have a reservation. <laughs> I got a reservation for me. I'm going to start using that. You got resis. Yeah. I love the, I mean, I love the passage about the sheep and hearing his voice and obviously Jesus is the good shepherd. And if you really dig into like the historical meaning of that, what Christ was saying, it was like the shepherds literally lived with the sheep. They were literally the door into the sheepfold and the sheep knew the shepherd's voice. And so if there was, you know, another lamb that wandered into the fold that wasn't of that shepherd's, wasn't one of the the shepherd's flock, they wouldn't recognize his voice. 
yeah. and they're not going to follow him. Um, you know, and, and, and or the goat, if there's a goat or whatever, like they're not going to, they don't know his voice, you know? And so I love that. Like, if you really dig into that, like it, just the picture that that gives us of God's work and salvation. So. Yeah. It goes back to the seal that you read in Ephesians, the seal of redemption. Yeah. Like there's a reason there's a seal on them. It's a seal of ownership. Yeah. Right. That's and, right. And Romans 11 talks about the grace of God and the gospel saying that the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Romans eleven twenty nine, It can't be taken away. Yeah. That's what irrevocable means. The gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. Irrevocable can't be taken away. Yeah. I mean, there's, if we have a few minutes, there's a couple more. If we want to read Yeah, that, yeah we, got, we got a few minutes. Let's uh, do it. I mean, let's do a couple. Um, Philippians 1, 6. I'll throw one out. Go ahead. And I'm sure of this, that he, he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. 2 Timothy 1.12, but I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. Jude one twenty four. now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and, pre- and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. 1 Thessalonians 5.23, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Do we do Ephesians 4.30 yet? No. Okay, Ephesians 4.30, And do not grieve, speaking to the people of God, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. One that everybody is familiar with, Romans 8, 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God mm. in Christ Jesus our Lord. Are we done? Mm. Are we done? I think we're done. No, think, we're done. We can keep <laughs> going, that, but yeah. That verse is like the one where it's like, just in case you were wondering if there was anything that you know, could separate it's you. Like, it's like, what? He's like, he's like, what like, things could people say could separate? He's like, not this, not this, not this, not this, not this. Yeah. What have I heard in my pastoral ministry? Yeah. But what about this pastor? What about this pastor? What about, he's like, well, it's okay. It's, it's not death. It's not this. Because he's writing, nothing can, nothing. <laughs> it, I think it just speaks to like the glory of Jesus' intercession for his people, too. Yeah. Like we hear in the book of Hebrews, he's able to save to the uttermost mm. those who draw near to God through him because he always lives to make intercession for him. How certain is your salvation? Jesus would have to die again. Mm. And he's not going to do that. Mm-hmm. And he's never going to fail to intercede for you before the father everything that he did on the cross is going to be true for you now and throughout eternity come whatever circumstances in your life and what you just said was essentially an explication of the thought of hebrews seven twenty five. consequently he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to god through him since he always lives to make intercession for them that's the promise Amen. you have an atonement it's a perfect atonement, able to save to the uttermost. He always lives to make intercession for us. He intercedes with his work before the Father for the people of God. This is why it can't be something that actually fails, because it's, it, it's a plan of the Father, accomplished by the Son, applied by the Holy Spirit of God. This is the work of the triune God of Scripture. In the end, and you brought this up the last discussion, and this is important, an important element because we're talking about what is biblical and Christian orthodoxy here, what is mm-hmm. most consistent, is that when we talk about the doctrines of grace, you're talking about the consistent perspective of how the triune God saves. saves. Yeah. Because you could have people that deny certain elements of it, where you have the Father wanting to save, Jesus trying to save, and the Holy Spirit failing to save right 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 and so you've got this disconnected work and this is a, the whole point you were making yeah. the disconnected work there between the the, the persons uh, of the trinity is you, in some sense somebody could say well yeah like the father wanted to save them jesus died for them but they ended up being lost because they didn't cooperate in some way impossible right exactly Trinitarian uh, heresy. It, it doesn't it doesn't work <laughs> that way and so that's that's the point is that the doctrines of grace guard against 
Trinitarian error mm-hmm. in God's glorious plan of redemption, because it's just a consistent story. The Father gave a people to Jesus. He chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. Jesus comes, sacrifices his life, gives his life and, and death and the resurrection for the people of God. He accomplishes that redemption. It's a finished sacrifice. The Holy Spirit of God comes, regenerates, and dwells God's people, and he keeps them till the end. Yeah. It's this perfect unity yeah. in the Trinity. And yeah. um, it's not conjured up some way. It's just, but that's what the text says. That's what God says he's doing there. But why do we get tripped up? Why all these other systems? And in the end, I think it's because we have traditions that, yep. that come, you know, that fly against the face of the text and their cherished traditions, maybe, like, well, I don't like to preach the gospel like that. I like to walk up to a random stranger in the street and say, hey, man, Jesus loves you, man. He died for your sins. Won't you let him into your heart? That's how I've always preached the gospel. I can't do that anymore. It's like maybe you should examine the, methodolo- the methodology that you've adopted for evangelism. You took the wrong course. Mm. Throw it away. I, I, and I'm not saying take the course of apologia like, you know, we've created this. Me- no. I'm saying just read Acts. Just read Acts. Yeah. Read how they preach the gospel. They didn't preach it like that. They would proclaim the work of Jesus. Here's who he was. Here's what Jesus did. He died. He rose again. And then there was the call. Repent and believe. Come to Christ for the forgiveness of sins. The call goes out generally to turn from sin to believe in Jesus. But you don't ever see the apostles walking up to a random person and saying, Oh, God loves you all so much. And Jesus loves you and died for your sins, everybody. Don't you want to just prepare? Everyone just, every eye. Every eye closed, every head bowed. I see that hand in the back. Okay, everyone. Yeah, I see that. Everyone, I want you to pray this prayer. You don't see it. It's not in the Bible. And you may love it. And I will confess, uh, I loved it. And I was always looking. Every time it was every head bowed, every eye closed, I was looking around to see who needs to get saved. Oh, who uh, saw her raise her hand last week? Who, who needs to be saved? Yeah. She's always raising her hand. <laughs> <laughs> but this is, but this is honestly the crazy thing to me. I know we're being, uh, we're joking here a little bit, but everywhere the apostles went, there was a public disturbance, mm. a riot, a mob formed, people taking oaths and vows to kill Paul uh, before the day's out, uh, not to eat again before they yeah. take his life. When has the gospel of Jesus loves you, won't you let him into your heart, resulted in a riot or a mob or a public disturbance? Generally doesn't. Never heard any example of that happening. No. No, not one. Mm -mm. Yeah. Yeah. If the gospel is going out, uh, this is the work of Christ. He commands all men everywhere to repent. Yeah. That's the kind of gospel. Jesus is king over Caesar. That's Mm -hmm. right. That's the gospel that leads to insurrection. Trouble. Yeah. Yeah trouble for sure i think we got a bunch of super chats do we really uh-huh. okay let's get to them let me uh let me turn uh, da, 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 da. okay um all right so uh thank you everybody for listening today let's get through our super chats today we are going to do more on this we're told we told you that we are also going to uh, do a particular show where we go through um uh, chestnut arguments against the uh, Reformed faith and Calvinism, uh, arguments against the doctrines of grace. We do want to do that as well, but we wanted to at least present the positive case from the scriptures here. Judoka! Hey, Judoka. I know what that means. 512. Uh, Greetings, brothers. Could you please explain to me John 316 from a Calvinist and limited atonement point of view? I always get tripped up there. Uh, thank you for that, Judoka. Uh, has to do with a judo practitioner. Um oh. So, first of all, John 3.16, uh, I want to uh, encourage you to look on YouTube because Pastor James has done some fine, fine work here just explaining to everybody, here's what the text says. We've, we've received this in such a tradi- traditional context and used it in such a tradi- traditional context. Oftentimes you miss what the text is actually even saying. This is a promise to believers, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten son so that every believing one whosoever believes every believing one would have eternal life but people say well the world he so loves the world yes the world is what was promised to the messiah jews gentiles people from every tribe tongue people and language they were all coming that was the promise that all of the nations would stream up to the mountain of god and so the world does not mean every single person who's ever lived uh the text there is making a promise about what God said he was going to do with the Messiah's kingdom. It was going to be not just Jews, but Gentiles also. 
the world, all the nations, tribes. Read Daniel 7, 13 through 14. Just because the word world, uh, the word world is used doesn't mean it refers to every single individual. Uh, like, for example, in John's gospel, where they say, look, the whole world is following him. Was every single person in the entire world following Jesus at that moment? So it doesn't it can it can be in a general sense. Um, however, the text is just a promise to God's people. Every believing one will have eternal life. Every believing one will have eternal yeah. life. That's what the text says. And so, um, uh, so I hope that answers it. Uh, it I would encourage uh, pick up uh, the Potter's Freedom. Potter's Freedom. Dr. Yeah. James White, his response to Norm Geisler's "Chosen but Free." Get into some of the the background of that text just to help you to say this is actually a, a solid promise to believers. Um, <clears throat> uh, da, 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 da. I guess Wally West was um, he was he answered. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Wally thank West. You, Wally. Um, thank you, Wally West, also for the super chat. Uh, Jordan Travis. Uh, my friend struggles with security about his faith and knowing he has saved your videos have sincerely deepened my understanding and faith. So thank you. Thank you, Jordan. I'm so grateful to God that that's true. Kelly Wilson. Thank you for the super chat. No comment. Thanks, <laughs> Kelly. Bless you. <laughs> thank you very much. All right, everyone. Uh, if you would also, um, pray for the work of end abortion now, right now, uh, go to endabortionnow.com. Uh, get your church signed up to go save lives. Uh, it is happening still across the country in every state. We need to work together as a church to abolish this. We have stuff happening in states across the country right now we need your help with. Uh, we need your hands and your feet. We need your prayers. And we also need you to help to give towards the work of End Abortion Now so we can pull all of this off. Uh, we are working on Alabama right now as the next stop for us uh, as a church to minister there. And so be in prayer for that. Uh, but I want to thank you guys all so much for your for your giving. Uh, also, I just wanted to point everybody, I think it's important, uh, go to Bonson U and get your free account with Bonson U. Uh, at apologiastudios.com. There's just a a treasure chest there with Dr. Greg Bonson, with all of his old sermons, his his lectures, his debates, everything. It's going to bless your life. Go sign up for Bonson U. It is free at apologiastudios.com. And uh, if you are interested in self-defense or hiking or being a woodsman or you just like blades, please go to amtacblades.com and get one of Bill Rapier's blades. We got our battle axe right here. If you want to chop your way through life, the I axe saw is at a the reel root. of him do it like working it actually oh, on yeah. a tree, and he's, I'm like, okay, I'm ridiculous. glad I'm not the tree. Like I'm, I, it scares me to death to do the things he was doing with this because I'm like, I'm gonna lose a hand. Mm -hmm. But uh, mm -hmm. you can go to AmtacBlades.com, uh, put apology in the coupon code and get five percent off, and he matches that and gives five percent to end abortion now, which is pretty awesome. Um, and of course, please, if you're homeschooling, go to heritagedefense.org. Please sign up, please, 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 for the sake of your children. It's not that much at all. It's very reasonable. Make sure you're protected if CPS ever comes to your door. Again, apology in the coupon code. Or any government officials. Or any right? any government Anyone official. that's like, I'm from the government, I'm here to yeah. help. I'm here to help. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. You speed just, dial. You just speed dial and put them on yep. with your attorney. And uh, it's it's an insane insanely low 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 ridiculously low, low price low, low. Uh, to have a nice uh, somebody <laughs> on speed dial that can defend you and your rights and defend your family uh make sure you guys do that uh thank you guys for listening today to apologia radio we'll be back next week with more that's luke the bear he's out i'm jeff they call me the ninja and that's zachary conover we'll catch you next week catch us at the after show oh guys. yeah we got the after show as well <laughs>